Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Mr. Justice Scalia, Mrs. Scalia, welcome to the John Adams Institute. As director of the John Adams Institute, I'm delighted to be able to open a new season here in the Aula of the University of Amsterdam with a lecture by U.S. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. As you know, the John Adams Institute is an independent organization that brings American speakers to the Netherlands. Our aim is to provide food for thought, create greater understanding, stimulate transatlantic dialogue, and generate a greater awareness of important issues. This evening, we are dealing with just such, just such an issue. Unfortunately, Mr. Arthur Dr. Svaleeuwen, our scheduled moderator for tonight, has a chronic back problem and had been forced to cancel for tonight. However, we are gratified to have found a worthy replacement on very short notice, I must say, in the person of Mr. Bert van Delden, Chair of the Netherlands Council of Administration of Justice, or in America they would say the Council of the Judiciary. It's a difficult word. Mr. Van Delden will introduce uh, Justice Scalia briefly and later conduct a dialogue with him here on the podium after he has given his talk. There will be no intermission, and in the course of, um, of the interview, members of the audience will have the opportunity to participate in the discussion. If you wish to speak, please use one of the two microphones available for that purpose. The program will end at around 9.45 with a closing word by Jitz Peters, Dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of Amsterdam. Before I hand over to Mr. Van Delden, I want to thank all of those who have helped make Justice Scalia's visit to the Netherlands possible, with a special mentioning in particular for Mauk Hudig, Jess Bailey and the University of Amsterdam. Please do refrain from smoking, switch off cell phones, and Bert, can I ask you to take the floor? I think I'll start from here. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, of course, you did come specifically for the lecture, and I would add the person of Justice Scalia, but I can imagine that you expected also a little extra from Arthur Dr. van Leeuwen acting as moderator and interviewer. In this aspect, I'm sure I have to disappoint you. Arthur is temporarily disabled, and now I run into trouble with my English. I wanted to say, because he went through his back. <laughs> but I had the definite idea that this was not a proper translation. However, the first native speaker I consulted offered because he put out his back. And the second one opted in favor of because he did in his back. <laughs> I leave the choice to you, but in any case, Arthur will not be here. <laughs> Dutchmen quite often have problems with the English language. I can tell you the famous story about the Dutch Prime Minister in wartime, Ger Brandy, who visited Sir Winston Churchill and entered his room and said, goodbye, Mr. Churchill. <laughs> Whereupon Churchill retorted, this is the shortest visit I ever had. <laughs> okay, let's see how we'll do make up today. Ladies and gentlemen, the Supreme Court of the United States counts only eight associate justices and one chief justice. It is astonishing, therefore, that chances to shake hands with one of them seem the best here in the Netherlands. In the last few months, we have had visits of at least four justices. Stephen Breyer, Sandra Day O'Connor, Anthony Kennedy, and today, Antonin Scalia. Even more remarkable than this, is that many law students in the Netherlands would quicker give the name of the Chief Justice of the United States than of our own Chief Justice, which, I hasten to say, does not mean that Brod Davids is not held in high esteem. <laughs> you shouldn't start laughing about that. We are very quiet here, but it is the quiet of a storm center. These are the words 
in which Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes described the Supreme Court in 1913. I think these words hold still true, and maybe these days even more than ever. The interpretation of the Constitution and the amendments made to it is, of course, the core business of the Supreme Court. And interpreting, especially interpreting of documents as old as the Constitution, is a difficult job. Justice Brennan has said, the founding fathers knew better than to pin down their descendants too closely. Enduring principles, rather than petty details, were what they sought to write down. And Charles Evans Youth, who became Chief Justice later, wrote, we are under a constitution, but the constitution is what judges say it is. And since judges quite often tend to disagree with each other and are not always very consistent in their own opinions, the facts are that ever so often justices overrule their predecessors and sometimes even themselves. I wonder what the views of Justice Scalia upon the way the words of the Constitution are to be inter interpreted will be. Another issue that seems to be as hotly debated in the United States as here in the Netherlands is the position of the judiciary with regard to the executive and to Congress, the legislature. The judges in the Netherlands are regularly confronted with the reproach that they are climbing in the driver's seat trying to take over the steering wheel. In the United States, already decades ago, Justice Jackson stated, this court has repeatedly overruled and thwarted both Congress and the executive. It has been in angry collision with the most dynamic presidents in our history, like Jefferson, Lincoln, and Franklin Roosevelt. Once again, I would be very interested to hear the ideas of Justice Scalia about the three branches of government as countervailing powers. Furthermore, I wonder how the court works, and I hope Justice Scalia will lift the tip of the veil. How important is the role of the clerks? Do the judges strive to reach a consensus, or do they cling to their own concurring and dissenting opinions? Also, I believe that the latest appointer, appointee, Stephen Breyer, joined the court more than 10 years ago. Is not there, I ask myself, a risk of a certain inflexibility, each one knowing what the position of the others is, when the junior has a seniority of more than 10 years? And finally, interesting for the Dutch judiciary, which has a mandatory retirement age of 70. How does it feel to work in a court composed of, as the saying goes, justices who never retire and seldom die? <laughs> I give the floor to Justice Scalia. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Van Delden. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, you, you, you will be surprised to learn that I, in my talk, will not answer all of the questions that Mr. Van Delden has uh, proposed. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry that the scheduled moderator uh, is not here because he threw out his back. <laughs> but I am sure Mr. Van Delden will uh, provide ample replacement. Uh, I'm happy to be here uh, at the University of Amsterdam. I spoke to uh, some of its law faculty uh, at lunch today. And I'm particularly happy to be uh, participating in a program of the, uh, the Adams Institute. Uh, John, John Adams is, uh, has long been uh, a, uh, uh, my favorite among the, among the, among the fa founding fathers in part because uh, he has to be. My, my wife uh, grew up in Braintree, Massachusetts, and uh, Adams was always her hero long before uh, his current renaissance. Uh, currently in the United States, he is uh, uh, perhaps eclipsing Jefferson. Uh, 
as, as you know, the two were competitors, and uh, of the two, I think Adams was, uh, was much the better man. I'm not sure what he thought about the Supreme Court. His son, John Quincy Adams, uh, uh, after returning from abroad uh, as a diplomat for many years, uh, complained to his wife, uh, uh, of, all, of all that I'm, uh, that it's possible for me to do, the worst is to be a justice of the Supreme Court. So uh, I'm not sure how enviable a position uh, it is. Let me proceed to my, my prepared remarks. In the first half of the last century, American political theory was obs obsessed with the expert. The key to effective government, it was thought, was to take the direction of government agencies out of the hands of politicians and to place it within the control of men experienced and knowledgeable within the various fields of government regulation. Accordingly, despite the fact that the United States Constitution calls for all executive power to reside in a nationally elected president, Congress created a series of agencies insulated from presidential control, in that their managers were not subject to presidential direction and could not be re removed from office by the president except for malfeasance. Typically, these so-called independent regulatory agencies were headed by a board of five or more members, no more than a bare majority of whom could be from the same political party, appointed for staggered terms of years exceeding the president's four-year terms. In this way, it was thought, politics could be taken out of the job of managing the economy. It was a job to be done by experts. Thus, there was created what came to be known as the headless fourth branch of American government, a series of alphabet agencies, such as the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, and the CAB, the Civil Aeronautics Board. It is fair to say that the project was a grand failure for two basic reasons. First and most important, it was discovered, and, and this should, should have come as no surprise, that many of the most important issues to be, de to be decided by government agencies, even agencies dealing with seemingly technical fields, such as telecommunications and transportation, have no right or wrong answers that experts can discover. They involve social preferences which in a democracy can only be expressed through the, through the political process. How many television sets, uh, stations, how many television stations uh, should the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, permit a single company to own? It depends upon how much you care about the quality of programming, by and large, uh, bigger operations can deliver more expensive programs, compared with how much you fear big company domination of television, including news and public affairs programming. There's no right answer to the question, only a policy preference. How much should the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, permit railroads to charge for the hauling of municipal waste? If they are allowed to charge the cost, which includes a reasonable profit, it will be very expensive to dispose of waste in this fashion. But perhaps we want to subsidize the burying of municipal waste in landfills so that cities will not pollute the environment by incineration. We can apply that subsidy by requiring railroads to charge below their cost for carrying municipal waste the deficit to be made up by permitting overcompensatory rates for other car cargoes, which of course amounts to a tax imposed on the consumers of those other cargoes. So, 
how much you permit railroads to charge depends upon, one, how much you care about the environment, and two, how much you are willing to subsidize cities. There's no right answer to the question, only a policy preference. And the second reason the, the project of the so-called independent agency was a failure is that it is quite utterly impossible to take politics out of policy decisions. That is not just a reality, it is, for those of us who believe in democracy, a blessed reality. The reduction in the elected president's control over the independent regulatory agencies was simply replaced by augmentation of the elected Congress's control. Agency heads were no longer removable by the elected president, but they were also no longer protected by his political power. He had no interest in protecting them since their acts were not his acts, their failures not his failures. Thus, the independent regulatory agencies became all the more subservient to the policy direction of the committees of Congress responsible for their budget and for their oversight. By the end of the 20th century, independent regulatory agencies were no longer fashionable. Indeed, two of the oldest of them, the, the Interstate Commerce Commission and the Civil Aeronautics Board, were abolished. But in the United States, and indeed throughout the world, belief in the expert has been replaced by belief in the judge moralist. Whereas technical quest, uh, questions we have come to learn do not have any signal, a single right answer, Surely moral questions do. Whether a woman has a natural right to an abortion, whether society has the right to take a man's life for, for his crimes, whether it is unfair and hence, in the terminology of the American Constitution, a denial of equal protection to permit marriage between people of opposite sex but not between people of the same sex, whether a human being has an unalienable right to take his own life, and indeed to have the assistance of others in doing so. These and many similar questions involve basic morality, basic human rights, and surely there is a right and a wrong answer to them. Well, I believe firmly that there is. That is to say, I believe in natural law. The problem is that my view of what natural law prescribes is quite different from others' views. And none of us has any means of demonstrating with anything approaching scientific certainty the correctness of his position. Thus, as a matter of democratic theory, there is no more reason to take these issues away from the people than there is to take away issues of economic policy because there is no moral expert to answer them. This is not to say that the people's conclusion can, o can always override my own conscience on these questions of right and wrong. In Nazi Germany, for example, even, it, even if it had been democratically determined that Jews and Poles had no right to live, I would be obliged to protect and defend them in defiance of the law in ne if necessary. But we are not talking here about individual responsibility. We are talking about who in a democratic society should have the power to determine the government's view of what the natural law is. And that seems to me obvious. Given that there is a natural law, the question becomes, what do the American people, or the Dutch people, or the Italian people, believe the natural law to be? Does it permit abortion or forbid abortion? And in an open democratic society, the people can debate these issues, each side trying to persuade the other to its own way of thinking. And the people, unlike the courts, can even compromise on these issues. For example, by leaving the issue of abortion to be dealt with in divergent fashion by the subunits of a federal state or by prohibiting only abortion performed in a particularly brutal fashion, or by permitting abortion uh, in case of rape or incest.
But in these early years of the 21st century, that is not the way we proceed. We have become addicted to abstract moralizing. That is relatively harmless when it appears in the operating documents of such international organizations as the United Nations, which can implement the moralization or not implement it as political convenience dictates. Stop or do not stop, for example, what our Congress has termed the genocide occurring in the Sudan. Nothing forces the UN's hand. But abstract moralizing is a dangerous practice when it is reflected in the operating documents of a nation state or a federation of nation states which require the, require the moralizing to be judicially enforced. There is nothing inherently wrong, for example, with Article 8 of the Council of Europe's Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, which provides in part that everyone has the right to respect for his private life. Who could possibly disagree with such an inspiring sentiment? Any more than one could disagree with the inspiring sentiment of Article 5 of the 1789 French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen that, quote, the law ought to prohibit only actions hurtful to society, close quote. But whereas the latter was left to languish as an inspiring sentiment with no attempt to have judges enforce it against the French Parliament. The former, the respect for private life, has been made enforceable against the democratic governments of Europe by judgment of the European Court of Human Rights. What does re respect for private li life consist of? Who knows other, other than the European Court of Human Rights? Four years ago, uh, that provision was held to invalidate a provision of the United Kingdom's law against gross indecency, which said that the law's permission of private homosexual conduct did not apply, quote, when more than two persons take part or are present. The Court of Human Rights held that the gross indecency law could not, by reason of the required respect for private life, be applied against a five-man homosexual orgy which the participants considered so little confidential that they videotaped it. The court did not specify how many people had to be participating in the sexual conduct before it could cease to qualify as, uh, as each one's private life. Presumably it's some number between five and the number required to fill the Colosseum. In the course of its opinion, not only did, did the seven-judge chamber of the Court of Human Rights definitively resolve for the people of Europe the scope of legally protected privacy, it also ruled definitively upon what is, quote, necessary in a democratic society for the protection of health or morals. For Article 8 of the Convention makes that an explicit exception to the right of privacy. I take no position, of course, on whether the prohibition of sex orgies is necessary for the protection of morals. That's none of my business. I do assert, however, that in a democratic society, the binding answer to that value-laden question should not be provided by seven unelected judges. The European Court of Human Rights uh, does not, of course, stand alone in making value-laden judgments for the society. My court does it all the time. Roe versus Wade is perhaps the prime example, requiring abortion on demand throughout the United States. But there are many more examples. Two terms ago, we held uh, laws against private consensual sodomy, laws that had existed in perfect conformity with our Constitution for over 200 years, to be impermissible citing, among other things, the Court of Human Rights' Dudgeon case to prove the meaning of the Due Process Clause of the American Constitution. We have held it impermissible to let juries decide, as they have done in the past, that a murderer should be condemned to death despite his mental retardation, or despite the fact that he was under 16 years of age when, when he killed. We have held it impermissible for a state 
to maintain a military college for men only, despite the fact that West Point, the Citadel, and the Virginia Military Institute had for more than a century not been thought to be in violation of the Constitution's requirement of equal protection of the laws. We have rejected, for the time being, a constitutional right to assisted suicide, but have reserved the right to revisit that issue. And I could go on. Why have judges not always been such pioneering policy makers? The answer is that until relatively recently, the meaning of laws, including fundamental laws or constitutions, was thought to be static. What vague provisions, such as a right to respect for private life or a right to equal protection meant, at the time of the Constitution's enactment could readily be determined in most controversial areas from the accepted and unchallenged practices that existed at the time. And what the Constitution permitted at the time of its enactment, it permitted forever. Only the people could bring about change by amending the Constitution. Thus, in, in 1920, when there had come to be general agreement in the United States that women ought to have the vote, the United States Supreme Court did not declare that the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution, which had existed since just after the Civil War, had suddenly acquired a new meaning, a meaning that it never bore before. Rather, the people adopted the 19th Amendment requiring every state to accord women the franchise. Under a regime of static law, static constitutional law, I mean, statutes can be as non-static as you like. Uh, you can change them every day. But under a regime of static constitutional law, it was not difficult to decide whether, under the American Constitution, there was a right to abortion or to homosexual conduct or to assisted suicide. When the Constitution was adopted, all those acts were criminal throughout the United States. And they remained so for several centuries. There was no credible argument that the Constitution made those laws invalid. Of course, society remained free to decriminalize those acts, as some states have done. But under a static constitution, judges could not do so. A change occurred in the last half of the 20th century. And I'm sorry to say that uh, I think my court was responsible for it, because it was my court that invented the notion of a living constitution beginning with the Cruel and Unusual Punishments Clause of our Eighth Amendment, we developed the doctrine that the meaning of the Constitution could change over time to comport with, as some of our cases say, quote, the evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. And it is we, of course, the justices of the Supreme Court who will determine when there has been evolution, and when the evolution amounts to progress. <laughs> On the basis of this theory, all sorts of entirely novel constitutional requirements were imposed. From the obligation to give a prior hearing before terminating welfare payments, to the obligation to have law libraries in prisons. For a time, the American Supreme Court was the envy of the judicial world. Ah, judges thought, if only we all could have such power to do good. And then, with the creation of constitutional courts in Europe, and ultimately the creation of the European Court of Human Rights, the power to do good came into every judge's hands, or at least the hands of every judge empowered to override legislative acts. The Court of Human Rights was quick to adopt the proposition that the convention was, as the court put it in 1978, quote, a living instrument which must be interpreted in light of present day conditions. And thus the world, or at least the West, has arrived at its current state of judicial hegemony. 
Let me make it clear that the problem I am addressing is not the social evil of the judicial dispositions I have described. I accept for the sake of argument, for example, that sexual orgies eliminate social, social tensions and ought to be encouraged. That's not my point. Rather, I am questioning the propriety, indeed the sanity, of having a value-laden decision such as this made for the entire society, and in the case of Europe for a number of different societies, by unelected judges. There are no scientifically demonstrable right answers to such questions, as opposed to answers that the particular society favors. And even if there were scientifically right answers, there would be no reason to believe that law-trained professionals can discern them more readily than, say, medical doctors or engineers or ethicists or even the fabled Joe Sixpack. Joe Sixpack is the American common man. Sure, surely it is obvious that nothing I learned in my law courses at Harvard Law School, none of the experience I acquired practicing law, qualifies me to decide whether there ought to be, and hence is, a fundamental right to abortion or assisted suicide. Judges' lack of special qualification to deal with such questions is disguised by the fact that they provide their answers in classic legal opinion form with boring recitations of the facts, the procedural history of the case, the relevant provisions of law, the arguments of the parties, and finally the court's analysis, which takes pains to demonstrate the consistency of today's decision with earlier decisions. The problem is that those earlier decisions, like the present one, fail to address the real issues which are of a nature too fundamental to be logically resolved by a law court. Thus, the Court of Human Rights uh, opinion in the Dudgeon case, which held that the prohibition of homosexual sodomy violated Article 8, that opinion found that the prohibition was not necessary for the protection of morals, while yet purporting in this opinion, quote, not to make any value judgment as to the morality of homosexual relations between adult males. Now, surely the morality of the practice was central to the question whether proscription of it is necessary for the protection of morals. I suggest that the court disclaimed any determination of the morality of homosexual conduct, not because it was irrelevant to the case, but because it is blindingly clear that judges have no greater capacity than the rest of us to determine what is moral. The same phenomenon of disclaiming resolution of the central issue in the case appeared in Roe versus Wade, where my court said that in order to decide whether a state must allow termination of a fetus's life at the wish of the mother, it was unnecessary to decide when human life begins. Of course, that question is central to the intelligent discussion of the issue. But judges obviously know, know more about it than you and I. Which brings me back to the comparison I suggested at the outset of these remarks. Just as scientific experts were unqualified to give the people's answer to the many policy judgments that inhere in any economic regulation, so also judges are unqualified to give the people's answer to the moral questions that inhere in any a priori assessment of human rights. And just as it proved impossible to take politics out of economic regulation, it will prove impossible to take politics out of the year-by-year -year refashioning of society's official views on human rights. In the United States, the mechanism for the infusion of politics has been the appointment and confirmation process for judges. Federal judges in general and the Supreme Court and Supreme Court justice in particular 
are nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate. Every presidential candidate since Richard Nixon has complained about an activist Supreme Court and has promised to appoint justices who believe in judicial restraint. And every Democratic presidential candidate since Michael Dukakis, at least, has promised to appoint justices who will uphold Roe versus Wade, which is synonymous with judicial activism. Each year, the conflict over judicial appointments has grown more intense and more bitter. Recently, it has expanded in our country to the, down to the Court of Appeals level. Democrats in the Senate refusing to permit a vote on Court of Appeals nominees who may expect to disagree with Roe versus Wade. Because of this political controversy, a number of seats on our Courts of Appeals remain unfilled. One shudders to think what sort of political turmoil will greet the next nominee to the Supreme Court to uh, uh, replace the aging Justice Breyer. He's about your age. I He's younger than I am, actually. <laughs> <laughs> The lesson is that in a truly democratic society, the people will have their say on significant issues of social policy. If judges are routinely providing the society's definitive answers to moral questions on which there is ample room for debate, rather than merely determining the meaning when enacted of democratically adopted texts, then judges will be made politically accountable. I would predict the same politicization of the European judicial process, but I frankly do not know what mechanism would make that possible. One of the checks upon judicial power that the framers inserted into the American Constitution was precisely the appointment of judges in a highly visible and highly political fashion, so that judicial appointments can be an important issue in a presidential election when the court begins to enter fields of, of general social policy. I am not aware that effective political checks exist with respect to European constitutional courts, the Court of Justice or the Court of Human Rights. Moreover, unlike in America, political hostility towards your courts cannot be personalized. Your courts have many members, and in numbers there is anonymity. Adding to the inability to assess blame is the fact that your judges ordinarily sit in panels rather than in bank. All nine of us always sit together so you can blame each one of us for every case. And uh, the opinions for your courts are not signed by a particular judge, as are the opinions of my court. For all these reasons, you will not see in Europe placards that are the equivalent of impeach Earl Warren, which we had in the United States, or impeach Harry Blackman, or <laughs> political mailings uh, similar to the interorum letter uh, sent uh, by a fundraiser for the Democratic Party, uh, uh, recently sent uh, mistakenly to my house, I assume mistakenly to my house, which, <laughs> which, which read on the outside of the envelope, Imagine Chief Justice Scalia. <laughs> I am not happy about the intrusion of politics into the judicial appointment process in my country. But frankly, I prefer it to the alternative, which is government by judicial aristocracy. I shall observe with interest the development of this issue in Europe. Thank you very much, Justice Scalia, for a highly provocative lecture. I wonder what would happen today. Would you have any idea yourself? You were uh, appointed and then confirmed by the Senate, I believe, on a bipartisan ticket of 99 to 0. No, it was only 98 to 0. 98 to 0, okay. But the two missing were Barry Goldwater and Jake Garn, who were the most conservative members of the Senate. So make it 100 to be, to be accurate. 
What would you expect today? Oh, today I, uh, I doubt that uh, my nomination would come to a vote. I think it would be, you know, our Senate has what is called a filibuster, and a minority of the senators can prevent a vote from being taken. If 40 of the 100 senators don't want a vote to be taken, they can stop it. And that's what has happened to some of our Court of Appeals nominees. But, you know, that, uh, that difference between 18 years ago, when, when I was known to be a, you know, a conservative in my social views, but I was also known to be a good lawyer, uh, an honest man, somebody who had a judicial temperament, would, would, would call it the way I honestly saw it. The difference between then and now is, is enormous. And I think the difference is that the American people have figured out that it's, it's not terribly important to have a good lawyer. I mean, it's nice. It's nice if your justices are good lawyers. But by God, the most important thing is to have a justice who's going to write the kind of new constitution that you like. One that has Roe versus Wade in it, or one that has a right to suicide, or whatever. The people have just figured it out. It was bound to happen eventually, and that's where we are now. And that was the part of my talk. Politics is inserting itself into the judicial selection process the way it, it has never been before. Do you have some kind of explanation uh, what make, made a change enormous change in the last 20, 30 years. You have been in the Supreme Court for 18 years right now. Mm -hmm. So at that time it was no problem at all mm -hmm. and now it's a very serious problem. Whereas in Europe uh, you mentioned <coughs> you were uh, highly critical about what the European Court of Human Rights uh, decisions are. But in our view... No, 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 no more so than my own courts. I mean, you know, don't, don't say that I've been leaning on the, uh, the European courts. I've, I've been no more critical of them than I am and of my own court. It's not the court I'm criticizing, it's, it's the process. Now, I understand for quite often when you said we, I don't believe you were the we. <laughs> That's correct? Well, it, uh, Justices of the Supreme Court often refer to the court as we, even if it's an old court that's, that's not been around for a hundred years. We say, we held. No, we didn't held. We've been, you know, these guys are dead for a hundred years. <laughs> so it happens every once in a year. <laughs> wow. But uh, still, um, the difference is that uh, you made it quite clear that's hotly debated in the United States, whereas in Europe, uh, that's barely an issue. The judiciary here in the Netherlands is not a political issue and you're not, I have to correct you to a certain extent, of course we are far bigger in numbers and we hand down our decision uh, anonymously you see three names under it but for instance the presidents of the courts um, are sitting what we call president in court geding which means that they have the power to hand down injunctions and some things like that and they yield an enormous power um, and they are to a certain extent, well, I may refer to my own position, I have been president of the district court in The Hague, and that is the court that deals with all the cases against the government. And I'm quite sure that uh, at my appointment, nobody was interested in my political views. That's not, I don't know, judges in the Netherlands don't know each other political views, un unless they are very close with each other, and that doesn't play a role. How come that in the United States it is that important? Because if your courts were making the kind of fundamental social policy decisions that our courts have been making for the last 35 years, the people would begin to understand that they have to take a role in the policy selection of the judges. The reason it didn't happen 18 years ago was the people had not tumbled yet to what was going on. It took them a while, but people are not stupid. Eventually they will understand that you are dealing here with an institution that doesn't know any more than, than you know about whether suicide is, is, is good or bad, or should be allowed or disallowed, and yet is imposing its judgment upon the entire society. It took them a while to figure it out, but they figured it out, and it now is very much a, a controversial question. You have senators who, who say, I will examine judicial nominees on whether they will uphold Roe versus Wade, whether they will do this or that. And it makes entire sense. 
if the most important function of the court is not the lawyer-like function of figuring out the text of a statute or the text of the Constitution, what it meant when it was adopted, but rather the most important function is to decide whether there ought to be a right to die. I mean, that's a different ball game. And our people have come to understand that. So you predict that the same will happen in Europe, and especially with the European Court of Human Rights? Only, only, because, only because I have uh, great confidence in the democratic instincts of the European people. <laughs> okay, you, you made some statements, and I want to go into that before giving people in uh, this audience hall the opportunity to ask questions, that there is one thing that always troubles me. Uh, the, and which is very clear in what you said, but not quite clear to me in any case. The position here in the Netherlands is that uh, someone will not be extradited if he runs the risk of being sentenced to death penalty. Capital, pen capital punishment is not allowed in the Netherlands, never, nowhere in Europe, and we won't extradite people, not even to the United States. In the United States, however, uh, the death penalty still exists, and if I am correct, you are of the opinion that the view that the death penalty is unconstitutional is preposterous. If I understand it correctly, you take the position that the Eighth Amendment could be read as an abstract principle, but also as a time-dated text. That is to say, guaranteeing, as I understand it, only the rights that were recognized at the time the amendment was enacted. And there I have to confess that this leaves me, not slightly, but absolutely confused. Um, and I would be very obliged if you could make it a little bit more clear to me. If you are confused, you, 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 must, you must think that what the framers of the Eighth Amendment intended was not that there be a baseline which a, which a later generation would not violate. That is to say, we believe that thumbscrews are cruel and unusual punishment. But that doesn't mean that a future generation has to, has to believe that it's cruel and unusual punishment. If a future generation thinks thumbscrews thumb are okay, that's fine. We have a living constitution. All the Eighth Amendment really means is, to thine own self be true. Don't do anything that you think is cruel and unusual. That obviously wasn't the intent of of the Bill of Rights. It was to impose the views of that society upon future societies because they did not believe that future societies would be as, 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 as virtuous or as intelligent as they were. And so, if, if future societies wanted to change it, they would have to amend the Constitution. That's the whole purpose of a constitutional provision. And, and how you can say that it evolves in one direction, oh yes, things that, that were not cruel and unusual can become cruel and unusual, but things that, uh, 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 that were cruel and unusual cannot suddenly become okay. I mean, it, it's a two-way street. And it's absurd to think that it's a two-way street. That, that's not what a constitution is for. It is, it is meant to rigidify. And this doesn't, and, and by the way, when, when we get into, into the death penalty, I mean, you say, oh, none of the nations of Europe permit it. You know, there's, oh, there's been a democratic vote of the people of Europe. You look, at, you look at the public opinion polls. None of the nations of Europe permit it because the European courts have not permitted it. And uh, I think the latest opinion poll in England said that something like 70% of the people favored the death penalty. So I, you know, I get a little uh, confused about that. I get a little fed up with the sanctimoniousness of uh, Europeans. Oh, you barbarous Americans, allowing the death penalty, which we allowed, you know, 30 years ago, but none of us allow it now, only because the judges said you can't have it. That's the reason I. <laughs> that's the reason I gave you the opportunity to Thank explain you. this. <laughs> so, that makes it. But would you do the same with Bro versus Wade if you? You say, the people? What do you mean? Well, uh, would you, you say it's only because of the judges uh, do it, and do you think in Roe versus Wade it's only because the judges allowed it, or 
is it also the people of the United States, or at least the majority of the people of the United States, who stand behind the ideas of Roe versus Wade? Well, that, I mean, that isn't the point. If the majority stand, a, stand behind it, they can pass a statute. I have no problem with that. Of course, it, it would be a statute that would ordinarily be passed state by state. Uh, people would try to persuade one another. You know, we think abortion is a terrible thing. The other side say, no, the right of the woman to control of her own body is a very important thing. And you debate it and you put it up to a vote. That's what democracy is about. And you try to persuade each other. But the situation in the United States now is, it's no use debating about it. It has been driven off of the democratic stage. Dem democracy is minimized whenever a court comes out with a constitutional decision. It tells the people, don't, don't debate about it. You cannot debate about it. And you know, that, that, that is simply not right when the Constitution, in fact, says nothing about the subject. It doesn't say anything in either direction. I would no more require the prohibition of, of abortion than I would forbid it. The Constitution is just silent. It's a matter for, uh, for normal dem democratic action. Yeah, so the answer, I guess, in, in brief, yes. <laughs> Okay, I want to move on to another subject which is of interest and which is debated here also as it is probably in the United States. And you are, the members of the Supreme Court are extremely powerful. You remain in office for a long period and people uh, look, uh, regard you very highly. Then you always have the problem that judges have to be impartial. And according to not only the Strasbourg rules, but also our own rules, but especially the Strasbourg rules, they even have to avoid the appearance of being partial. When I was a judge, I always thought twice before accepting invitations, especially as a free rider for a special concert or something like that. And I would imagine that being a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, you run the risk of getting overloaded with all kinds of invitations that would give rise to the thoughts about your impartiality. On the other hand, it is absolutely unthinkable and it would be considered rude to turn them down straight away. So, is there a recipe about the do's and don'ts that you can give to European judges? <laughs> Is that uh, uh, do's and don'ts? Look at much, much of uh, uh, judicial ethics consists of traditional and accepted practice. For example, it is not at all unusual in England for, for the high court judges who have sat on a case immediately after the argument to go to the inns of court and have lunch with the solicitors who argued the case. It's just, it's just not considered a violation of judicial ethics. Now that would be considered a terrible violation of judicial ethics in the United States. If you hear an argument and then go out to lunch with a lawyer who argued it before you, it would never, would never be considered. So I, you know, I hesitate to prescribe for the Europeans. Uh, you know, the, the, <laughs> one of the, one of the, uh, uh, really, the, the trap for the unwary in any code of judicial ethics is, uh, is there's always a, a residual provision which says, besides not doing A, B, C, D, E, and F, you should not do anything else that would create the appearance of impropriety. Well, my, what does that mean? I don't know. Uh, if somebody says it's improper, I guess it has created the appearance of impropriety. Whereas anything that has created the appearance of impropriety is impropriety. So the thing next to it becomes the appearance of impropriety, you know, and, and it ratchets up each year. I think that's, uh, that's part of the problem. Um, I think you, you just have to follow the customs of the, of, of the bar in, uh, in your particular area, and I've, I've tried to do that in, in my country. Thank you. Always difficult with these microphones. No, I have to turn okay. I think it's time to 
have a look into this audience hall. Maybe you could state your name and make your sentences, your, your questions as crisp as possible. Your Honor, my name is Tom Zwart and I'm of the University of Utrecht. Um, administrative law is not for sissies or girly men, you would say, nowadays. <laughs> uh, that was what I thought when you started your very interesting uh, lecture tonight. Because you argued that people on administrative agencies, which is not a surprise knowing you, uh, are not the experts and the technocrats we expect them to be, but they make value-laden, policy-laden decisions. How can we square that with the Chevron decision taken by the Supreme Court just before you became a justice? Because the essence of the judgment is that, we, that the court should, leave, sh should show deference toward the agency because it is an expert agency, or has it something to do with the separation of powers which you feel so important? I have to admit that I, when I left this, my home this morning, I wanted to ask you a question about standing because I know that's a topic which interests you very much as it well. It does indeed. I hope that I have the occasion to ask it anyway. We'll but do later. it afterwards. Okay. Uh, this is a very good question. I'm afraid it's, uh, it's, it's a little abstruse to most of the audience. Uh, the Chevron case is a case in which the Supreme Court held that when an agency of the executive branch interprets a statute in executing the statute, it says, we're executing it and we think it means this. So long as the agency's interpretation is somewhere within the range of reasonableness, the court will not reverse the agency. In other words, it's up to the agency to give the interpretation, so long as the interpretation is reasonable, even if it isn't the best interpretation, even if it isn't the one that the court itself, if it did it as an original matter, would come to. That's what the Chevron doctrine is. And the question is, if I think that agencies aren't such doggone experts, why, why should I defer to them this way? I'm not deferring to them because they're experts. I'm deferring to them because they're president, who ultimately controls them, has been elected. And I haven't. That's why I'm deferring to them. It's not a matter of expertness. It's a matter of leaving reasonable interpretation of the laws to the executive branch, which is elected by the people. Which means that whenever we elect a new president, he can move the country in a new direction without amending all the laws. There are some laws that have some you know, some less elasticity in how they can be interpreted. And whereas the last administration wanted to interpret them strictly this way, he can decide, hey, you know, that's a little too, too tight, we'll interpret it this way. That's why we elect presidents, because uh, they, they can change things. So that's, that's why Chevron uh, makes sense. I mean, and the other reason is historical. But, uh, you know, the uh, judicial review in the United States developed out of the prerogative writs, in particular mandamus and injunction. And mandamus traditionally could not be issued unless the agency action was clearly wrong. Not just wrong, but clearly wrong. Um, my name is Wilhelmina Thomas. I'm judge of the European Court of Human Rights. <laughs> And I came... And nominated uh, for the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, so <laughs> be nominated. careful. Um, I came tonight to uh, hear more about the Supreme Court, and I was very surprised to hear so much about my own court. And I must say you are very well informed, and uh, except one thing, and that I would like to correct, and after that I would like to make one remark on your very interesting speech. The judges uh, of the European Court of Human Rights are not nominated, they are elected. They are elected by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and uh, they are elected only for six years, so they are not the, the, hobby, the, the, the powerful people who dictate morals in Europe so long. Um, that's one thing. Uh, then my remark. <coughs> I have the impression that you uh, exager exaggerate largely the uh, difference, the, the, the contradiction between democracy and judiciary. Uh, and anyhow, in Europe, 
I think the European Court of Human Rights, for example, is clearly the product of democracy. We all wanted courts to enforce, for example, human rights. The European Convention for Human Rights was, uh, is a treaty, and all the member states of the Council of Europe uh, are involved in the execute, execution process of the judgments given by our court, which means that in fact, the contradiction with the, the, which is made uh, by you for Europe is, well, is a little bit exaggerated. And as far as I see the problem, you, you raise a very interesting issue, the, 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 the limits between judges' power and, 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 uh, par and parliament, in fact. Uh, I, in, as I see it for Europe, it is more, uh, we have more the discussions about checks and balances because we don't have judges because they are experts. They are part of state's power and they are uh, um, there in our modern societies to balance the power of the people and the government. So that's um, not a question but to clarify my uh, position as a member of the court. Thank you for your interesting uh, speech. Madam, you, you are no more elected than my court is. Uh, any, any, any nominee to my court has to be approved by the United States Senate. You don't know what being elected is. You should come to the United States in some of the states that do elect judges. You, you run an election campaign. You go down to the citizens and tell them why they should vote for you. That's being elected, not being confirmed by some legislative body from a list of nominees that somebody else submits. That's not what I mean by election. We, we, we just have a misunderstanding as to what election consists of. In the back. Maybe you'd better use this microphone. Good evening. I'm Candace Moore, I'm a student at Webster University. Uh, my question is, uh, as I know, when a voter votes for a particular candidate, he or she uh, votes for electors as well unknowingly, if I understand it right. According to the Amendment of tw 24, Section 1, the right of the citizens of the United States is to vote in any primary or other election for president or vice president for electors or for senator or representative in Congress shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state. Therefore, it goes on, so, so, so forth and so on. Therefore, since the American people have this right, my question is, do you believe it would be a better solution to have the American citizens vote for the electors knowing exactly who they are, um, therefore having a solution for both parties um, against, which is what I feel, a uh, solution uh, for both parties, for against, uh, for and against the electoral college. I'm sorry, I don't understand the, the question. Okay, um, for example, when we vote for a particular candidate for president, we're actually voting for the electors unknowingly. And um, I believe that I want to know: Do you believe it would be a better solution for the American people to know and to be able to knowingly vote for the electors? outright to know who they are. You mean vote for the president outright? No, to vote for the electors. Well, Every time someone goes to vote for a president, they're actually voting for the electors as well, without knowing it. But I'm not an expert, but what's the difference? That you <laughs> don't know. That's the thing. This you is know, the controversy about the electors. You know to college. which party they belong, and their duty is to elect a president. And the when you vote for a certain... Electors actually are attached to the particular party, either Republican yes. or Democrat. So every time someone votes for a particular candidate for president, they're unknowingly voting for, the, for electors for that state. I, I actually, I'm very clear on this because I did the research. I did a paper I, the other day. You know, so um, <laughs> this actually my paper is due on. <laughs> so... I think it's unimportant to the average voter who their elector is. He doesn't even know their name. The, I, that's, they, they, care the that, they care who that person is going gonna, is gonna to cast his ballot for. However, so you, you I, have electors under the Republican ticket, electors under the Democratic ticket. When a voter votes for it, he doesn't know the name of the elector. Who, you know, but don't you believe that we should know it because 
this is the right of the democracy. This is the whole controversy as far as the Electoral College. We're, the electors are choosing who our presidents are. So since we know you are not going to take the Electoral College out, we should be able to vote for the electors and then let them choose the president. That way it's, for, it's, it's a good solution for people for the Electoral College and for against it. I guess that's important if you would... <laughs> if you intended to vote Republican, but would not vote Republican if the elector's name was Schwartz instead of Kelly. But I don't think that's going to make a difference to the so, average voter. I just So don't. you don't think the solution, what, what do you think, like the solution, do you, I mean, for the electoral college, it's a very controversial issue. And, you know, I, I mean, what is your kind of feel on that? Maybe I will interrupt. I think this is going to be a rather technical yes, discussion and okay. maybe not of interest for the, too much interest for Okay, but thank you other. anyway for your Thank you very much for your question. I'm sorry, I can't be helpful. Hello, I'm Ron Holtzacker from the Department of Political Science at University of Twente. Microphone. I'm Ron Holtzacker from the Department of Political Science at the University of Twente and University College Utrecht. I'm also a member of the bar in the state of Minnesota and Washington, D.C. And, Your Honor, I have a question about, in your view, under what circumstances should the judiciary protect minority rights against the will of the democratic majority? Or, in the language of James Madison, what role should the courts play in avoiding the tyranny of the majority? <laughs> it, uh... It, it's a very easy answer. The, uh, look, un unless you believe that the majority rules, you do not believe in democracy. That's what democracy is about. We debate things with each other, and then we put it to a vote, either as a whole or through our representatives. And the majority wins. But in liberal democracies, we put certain things aside. And we say the majority will not win, unless you can amend the Constitution, with regard to certain matters, and some of those matters with regard to which the majority does not win, are matters that concern minorities. Freedom of speech pertains to political minorities. You will not silence political speech that's contrary to what the majority likes. Freedom of religion pertains to religious minorities, all right? Now, there are innumerable other minorities in the world. Pederasts are a minority, you know, an unpopular minority. Now, should it be up to me to invent protections for minorities that the majority has not decided to protect? My answer is no. I protect those minorities that the majority has decided to protect. And the majority has made that decision in our Constitution, in our Bill of Rights. And every time I invent a new minority, I am, I am being a willful judge and, and, and not following uh, the, the democratic decision of, of my country. So, uh, I, listen, I protect, I protect those minorities that the Constitution protects more rigorously than some of my colleagues who believe in the living Constitution. I was the fifth vote in the, in, 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 in the case that said you can burn the American flag and that cannot be constitutionally prescribed because political minorities are protected by the Constitution, minorities of expression. And I can give you several other examples. But to say that, uh, that it's my job to look around the world and identify other deserving minorities which in my magnanimity I decide to protect uh, is, is not my notion of uh, the political system we have. Mr. Justice Scalia, my name is Martin Vermame. I'm an please attorney. Speak Amsterdam. a little bit louder or closer okay. to the microphone, please. My name is Martin Vermame. I'm an attorney in Amsterdam, and I was intrigued by your faith, I guess, in the democratic majority and the restraint that the judiciary should have in intervening in that process. And I guess that the pivotal decision of the Supreme Court in that respect was Brown versus Board of Education, where they put an end, where they said that segregation in, in schools was unconstitutional. Now, for decades and decades and decades, uh, black children 
did not go to the same schools as white children. Uh, perhaps they didn't even go to schools. And it was perceived as an evil by the Supreme Court in the 50s. And clearly, they didn't want to wait until democratic majorities would have been formed to change that system. Now, are you saying that, based on what you told us tonight, um, the Supreme Court could never have arrived at the decision that for decades and decades and decades uh, segregation had been unconstitutional without anybody knowing it? Or are you saying that this was an instance in which you felt that the Supreme Court was right, just as you said that there are reasons, such as in Nazi Germany, um, that one should say that there is a natural law which, which goes beyond the will of the majority. Thank you. There are two answers. Uh, first of all, and, and probably the, the less important answer, uh, Brown versus Board of Education was, was not one of the unenumerated minorities that the previous questioner was talking about. The Constitution explicitly protects racial minorities. That's what we fought a civil war about. And the 14th Amendment prevents, forbids, uh, refusal to give equal protection of the laws, in particular with respect to race. So my Constitution protects that explicitly. I don't have to invent some minority protection for Brown versus Board of Education. Now, I think that I would have voted with Justice, the first Justice Harlan, who dissented in Plessy versus Ferguson, which was the case that said that Louisiana could require black people to ride in a separate railroad car. I would have dissented because I am a textualist. I take the text of the Constitution and give it its reasonably understood meaning. And a provision directed explicitly to race, which said you shall not deny people equal protection of the laws, I think cannot be squared with re allowing white people to ride in a railroad car, but not allowing black people. Wait, wait let me finish. That's the first answer. Are you going to allow him a follow-up? Yes, of course. He, he wants to take one. <laughs> That's the less important answer. The more important answer is you cannot judge the validity of a system of, of philosophy or of interpretive philosophy on the basis of whether now and then it can produce a wonderful result. I'll stipulate that. I'll stipulate that willful judges can now and then do wonderful things, as can kings and emperors. But that doesn't prove that, that, that monarchies and empires are good. Uh, it, it proves nothing whatever. A stopped clock is right twice a day. <laughs> you have to consider the entire system and say, over the long run, over the long run, is this the best way to go? And as for, you know, democracy, my, my great uh, faith in democracy, I have no choice but to have faith in democracy because all the power I have comes to me through the democratic process. I cannot at one in the time exert that power and repudiate it. Okay, but if I can make just one minor comment. Very short one. Yes. It, it strikes me because one of your main arguments with regard to all these new rights being read into the Constitution is that you say, well, look at history. This has never been recognized. For decades and decades and decades, the people have behaved in a certain way which they found totally constitutional. You can't simply say that it's unconstitutional today. My point about Brown versus Board of Education was that in spite of this dissent by Justice Harlan years back, it was perceived by the majority of the people as the law of the land that segregation was constitutional. So, in fact, what you're saying is that everybody was wrong for, say, 130 years. No, only the court was wrong. If, if the court had not come down with Plessy versus Ferguson, there would have been considerable uh, controversy over whether that practice was constitutional. But the court wrongly decided Plessy, and so the question was, uh, was, was off the plate. But in any, in any event, that, that argument does not answer the more important point that I make, which is the second point. Well, I give you Brown. Let's assume Brown wouldn't have happened. So what? It does not prove that uh, the kings are good. Please. Uh, 
into the microphone, please. My name is Osteen Wouter. I'm a student at the Amsterdam Nijndrooy University Law School. And I would like to know that uh, we all know that the government normally consists of... I, I, it's very difficult to understand. Okay. Uh, I repeat. I repeat. So my name is Osteen Wouter. I'm a student at the Amsterdam Nijndrooy Law School. And my question is following. We all know that the government normally consists of three branches. But uh, nowadays, there's a tendency of merging these three branches into a, a huge conglomerate. Therefore, I would like to know in which sense a new victory of the Republicans, in person of uh, George W. Bush, or a victory of the Democrats, in case John Kerry, influences the decision-making by the Supreme Court. We have to remember this becomes prominent when we know that you, as a judge of the Supreme Court, played a prominent role in uh, the decision to stop counting in the, or recounting in the Florida, and thus allowing uh, Mr. President or Mr. Bush to become president without uh, bothering to count the votes. Can you give your opinion on this? Well, I think it's quite clear that the history of the United States. Uh, Supreme Court has proven that it doesn't make any difference which president sits. Um, of course, there is a, uh, as I may answer this question, <laughs> <laughs> if you permit me and you can correct me, of course, there are many, uh, it is to a certain extent, of course, a political decision what kind of justices will sit in the Supreme Court. Justice Scalia has uh, uh, explained that, but I might remind you to what uh, President Eisenhower said. Uh, when he was asked, did you make any mistakes in your career as a president? He said, yeah, at least one, and that one is sitting at the Supreme Court. So. Actually, actually he said two, and they're both sitting on the Supreme <laughs> Court. He, he was referring to Earl Warren and, and, and uh, William Brennan. <laughs> you want to add something to that? Uh, what? Look, I don't want to get into the, into the election thing. If, you, your premise is entirely wrong. Had the, court, had the court not intervened, the American press did their own recount of the dangling chads and the hanging chads and all of this silliness that made us the laughing stock of the world for, for three weeks. And the press's conclusion was, had the Supreme Court not intervened at all, the election would have come out exactly the same way if the ballots were counted the way the, uh, uh, the Gore camp wanted. That is well established by the American press, which is not n known to be favorable to George Bush. And, uh, uh... Okay, I think, I think we have time for, at the most, two more questions. Uh, my name is Dallas Rademacher. Uh, Mr. Justice Scalia in, Scalia, in answer to a previous question, you said that uh, in, democracy meant that the majority should have its way in most cases. In fact, you said the majority should have its way unless the people in establishing a constitution had identified a particular minority whose rights ought to be protected against the majority. And I wonder if, uh, in applying that principle, you believe in always going back to the text of the Constitution, or only, or what weight you give to the interpretation given to that text by previous decisions of the court, in the case of your court, over 200 years of its existence. So, yeah, that's, that's a good yes. I understand the, the it's a very, <laughs> It's a very good question. Actually, the hardest part about being a justice on the Supreme Court, as opposed to the Court of Appeals, is precisely this question. On the Court of Appeals, I know my marching orders. If the latest Supreme Court case says to do thus and so, although I believe it is an incredibly stupid case, I say it, that's what they say, that's what I do. But when I'm on the Supreme Court, it's my stupid case. And, and the, the issue you're confronted with is whether you adhere to the prior law or depart from it. Now, my court has never had a rigid rule of stare decisis, especially not in constitutional cases. From the time of John Marshall, we overruled earlier constitutional cases for the very good reason 
that in statutory cases, if we in, we're quite rigid on stare decisis with regard to the interpretation of statutes. If we say a statute means something, don't come back and, and ask us to reconsider it and say it means something else. We'll, we'll say, you know, Congress can fix it. If indeed we got it wrong, Congress can fix it. Congress cannot fix our constitutional mistakes. If we interpret the Constitution incorrectly, it can't be repaired by anything except the massive effort of a constitutional amendment. So we have never had rigid stare decisis in constitutional matters. Now, as a matter of practice, I adhere to many constitutional decisions that I think were probably wrong when they came down. I, I generally adhere to stare decisis. Um, it de whether I do depends on a number of things. How wrong was it? You know, was it willfully, abysmally wrong? Number two, more important, has it generally been accepted? For example, I don't believe that the Federal Bill of Rights was ever meant to apply to the states. Freedom of the Freedom of Religion Clause of the Federal Bill of Rights was never applied against a state until the 1940s. It, it's the doctrine of, the so-called doctrine of incorporation, which claims that the Bill of Rights, adopted in 1791, was applied to the states by the 14th Amendment, which was adopted after the Civil War. That doctrine of incorporation was a controversial doctrine when I was in law school. But that's been accepted now. I will not refight that battle. I would not dare, because it's generally been accepted. I would not dare to tell the people of, of New York State <laughs> that freedom of religion in the First Amendment doesn't apply to New York State. Of course it does. I mean, it, it's done. So how well accepted has it been? Third factor, can I deal with it as a judge, or do I have to become a philosopher king? The reason I do not adhere to Roe versus Wade is that it fails both of the last two tests. It has not been generally accepted. It has been bitterly controversial ever since it came down. But more importantly, I do not know how to apply Roe versus Wade as a lawyer. Roe versus Wade, as interpreted in our latest case, a case called Casey, the principle regarding abortion is this. Uh, no state may place an undue burden on the woman's constitutional right to an abortion. Okay, now, let's imagine the next case that comes before my court. Let's assume it's a state law that says before a minor child can have an abortion, the abortion provider must notify her parents and wait two days to give the parents a chance to talk to her. They can't stop her, but they can talk to her. Wait two days. Is that an undue burden on the minor's constitutional right to an abortion? How do you think the discussion will go in, in, the, in the conference of my court that discusses that issue? What, what do you think we'll talk about? What, what legal, lawyerly doctrines you know, it'll go, I guarantee you, something like this. Let's see, notify the parents and wait two days. I don't think that's an undue burden. Do you think it's an undue burden? What about you think it's an undue, how many think it's an undue burden, you know? Five hands, it's an undue burden. Four hands, it isn't. That, that to my mind, is not law. And so I will not do that. And, and that, that, that is one category of case. I will not adhere to stare decisis. I will vote against that, uh, that doctrine of our court as, as often as it comes before me. So uh, that's the answer. There are a number of factors go into it. I think the most important is how generally accept, how wrong is it, how generally accepted has it been. And for me, most important of all, can you behave like a lawyer when, when, when you're applying the doctrine? Would, would application of that kind of analysis lead you to reject all the cases in the line of Griswold versus Connecticut establishing a right to privacy. Do you feel that those no, cases, no? Not, not necessarily. I don't think, certainly not all of them has been as controversial as Roe versus Wade. Are you kidding? <laughs> most, most Americans don't even know Griswold. Yeah. Thank you. Normally it's ladies first, but I'm afraid 
Wood that Hall this will be ladies last. So you are the last right. person. No, sorry. Can you hear me? But certainly there will be another Justice of the Supreme Court coming soon. So. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi. And thanks. they are not interchangeable, however. <laughs> thanks for coming to visit us in Holland. My name is Andrea. I'm American and I did my degree in organizational psychology here in Holland at the University of Utrecht. Uh, in contrast to the United States democratic two-party system, in Holland, the democracy is seen as successful having a coalition. Every once in a while, at least. <laughs> Let me finish. Um, <laughs> okay. How unfair for the other people who wanted to ask a question. Um, could I ask you to speak on, uh, briefly explain to me why uh, Ralph Nader, the current presidential candidate, independent candidate, uh, also Harvard Law School graduate, is not being allowed uh, to be in on presidential debates uh, while he seems to have a huge uh, following in the United States? Is, is my question clear? I'm interesting, interested in if you could speak a on absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you know him personally? No, I, I don't know, know if all the Har Harvard Law School... No, I know. No, I know. Old Boys Club. I think it was, I think it was a year after me, actually. <laughs> I, I think he might have been in Justice Kennedy's class. Maybe he knows. Year. Ask Justice Kennedy. He might know. Uh, the reason he's been excluded is, uh, is because of state, uh, state laws concerning, uh, concerning the ability of parties to, uh, uh, to be listed on the ballot. You have to file certain procedures, uh, f follow certain procedures. In some cases, you need a certain number of, of signatures of people. But to put you states, and in, in some sorry. states, he didn't acquire the correct number of signatures. In other states, it was from, for some other reason. Now, but what would be the harm of having him be involved in, in a debate on, on television? A lot of people have never heard of him, and he has a huge following, doesn't he? Oh, are you talking about his getting on the ballot or his being in the debates? I, I, I was answering it. the ballots first. All of okay. it. Why well, two parties? He didn't system? get on the ballots because he didn't meet the requirements, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> he didn't, he didn't, he isn't allowed in debates because most of, I believe the reason is that most of the organizations that sponsor the debate believe that the race is, is essentially between two candidates and that what most people want to hear are the contrasting view of those candidates. Now, they, they may be wrong about that, but I think that's the reason that they're excluding him. And I can ask you a question. If you want Ralph Nader excluded, why not exclude, you know, the, uh, the gold, include the, uh, uh, the leader of the gold currency party? I mean, there are innumerable other little tiny parties in the United States. Is that a fair comparison? States. Pardon me? Is that a fair comparison? I think it's very fair. I think the gold, uh, the gold currency party has about as much a chance of, of winning the election as Ralph Nader. <laughs> And, and, you know, and, and, and it, it reminds me, at, at one point... Uh, Things they don't teach you at Harvard <laughs> Law School. <laughs> at, at one point, one of, one of, <laughs> one of the more, more conservative uh, American political commentators, William F. Buckley, ran for mayor of New York on the conservative party ticket. And he was asked by some candidate, uh, you know, Mr. Buckley, what would, you, what would you do if you were elected mayor? And Buckley said, call for a recount. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Before yielding the floor to the dean of the law faculty of Amsterdam University, Jit Peters, I want to make a remark, I wanted to make a remark to this audience, but you understood me very well in your last uh, applause for I noticed that you applauded quite a uh, few people who put some very difficult questions, but you didn't applaud the man who answered all these difficult questions. You did in the last day, and I think he needs, he deserves an applause.
Actually, what I need is a drink. <laughs> But I'm afraid you have to wait. <laughs> Ladies and uh, gentlemen, Mr. Justice Scalia, we all need a drink. <laughs> so I will not um, uh, tear you with a lengthy speech. And besides, um, I have also uh, some considerations about your opinions, but I think it is not fair because you like to contradict anyone who poses a question, and it would not be fair uh, that you don't have an opportunity to contradict me. Um, the second uh, uh, important uh, remark is the first remark is that there will be drinks at the, um, uh, at, at the back of this uh, building at the library. Uh, so everybody is free to have a uh, drink with us. That's the most important concluding remark. The second one is that the next event of John Adams Institute, uh, that will be on the uh, 21st of September, And then not a Supreme Court justice will come, but an historian, David McCullen, a biographer of John Adams. And he will be here at the auditorium of this university. This afternoon, I was the advisor of a member of parliament, uh, Femke Halsema, who introduced a private, ball, a private bill, a pri not a ball, <laughs> The ball is in the court, but the bill is in the house. A private uh, bill to uh, introduce judicial review in the Netherlands as to constitutional review. Because the Netherlands is the only state uh, in, the, in Europe, member state of the EU, where we don't have judicial review. And of course it is difficult to convince politicians To, uh, to transfer powers to the judiciary. And some of the parties are still hesitant to do that. I think they would be less hesitant and are in, in less opposition of judiciary review when they would be under this audience tonight and have heard the uh, lecture of uh, Justice Scali. Because then they would uh, know that because of his view of textualism, there was no danger that he would uh, hamper the political process. Um, but all the arguments that we put forward to defend this piece of legislation were against some of the arguments I heard tonight. The first argument is op uh, the opposition of Justice Scalia against a constitution as a living instrument. We, in the Netherlands, and that the constitution, constitutional law is static law. We in the Netherlands have not a living constitution, but a dead constitution. <laughs> It is always a monument. Enduring, sir, enduring. You have to package it better. <laughs> <laughs> but you would be thrilled thrilled to live in a country like the Netherlands with a dead constitution <laughs> and a very static one. But because of the character of that constitution, we made the argument that we needed judicial review. The second argument you have put forward anyway in, the, in, in your book, A Matter of Interpretation, and you also put forward today, is that the constitution is an bulwark against change. It is a static instrument. We think that we need an instrument just for change. There's another argument. And the third argument I like to put forward is uh, when I was a student at the Columbia Law Faculty um, in, in uh, New York, we were thrilled by the way the American Supreme Court uh, was dealing with cases was dealing with cases. And especially, uh, we were enthusiastic, and the teachers were enthusiastic about the Warren Court at that time. When you read your book, I was shocked when you stated, as last sentence in your book, the glorious days of the Warren Court, when the judges knew that the Constitution means 
whatever it ought to, but the people had not yet caught on to the new game, are gone forever. Those were the days in which generally unpopular new minority rights could be created, notably rights of criminal defendants and prisoners. That era of public naivete is past, and for individual rights disfavored by the majority, I think there are hard times ahead. Those were the days when we studied them. Well, I was uh, taught by other uh, professors than, uh, than you. You were a professor also in law in, in the past, uh, especially by Professor Lusky, who had written a book, By What Right? Uh, that the court has to play, and it was also, uh, well, also in the questions that were put before you, that the court has to play a special role in defending the democratic process and in upholding minority rights, insular minority rights. And that were also the arguments that we have put before Parliament uh, today uh, in uh, trying to convince them uh, to uh, introduce judicial review in the Netherlands. You made an argument, and that's the last uh, argument I'd like to take up with you, is that, yeah, because you long to your drinks, I think, eh? that is uh, a definition of democracy uh, that we are not cherishing in our constitutional debates. We think democracy is more than majority rule and has also an elections and has also something to do with the question of protection of minorities and with civil rights. And we think that there is no contradiction between democracy and what we call the Rechtsstaat. You may perhaps put forward the rule of law, but it is a little bit uh, different. And also, uh, uh, Justice Willy Thomason has put forward quite this argument. Before closing, I'd like to tell you that we enjoyed your lecture. And I have never... And so far, I've never met a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States uh, declaring about his own position that it is not an enviable position. And secondly, I've never and met... finally, probably? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And finally, I've never met a justice who said the power to do good in the hands of the judges is not what I want to do. Most people like uh, to do good, and especially judges when they have the power, but that was not the case and is not the case with you. And I think that is remarkable. And I like to thank, especially as I was uh, already uh, doing, to thank uh, Justice Scalia uh, about his provoking speech. It provoked many questions. And secondly, I like also to thank uh, Bert van Delden for chairing this, uh, this meeting and replacing uh, at such a, note, a short notice uh, here having the role of a moderator. I thank him very much. Um, and now finally, I think it is time for the drinks. But as a moderator, the final words remain with me. Um, I think... Um, it's only because Justice Scalia uh, has indicated himself that he wanted a drink that I will not give him the opportunity to answer uh, what Jit Peters has said. But my own feelings are that politeness is not the main hallmark of the Amsterdam University.